Good morning and welcome to Houghton and Kingmore Church here in Carlisle. My name's Nick and I'm a member of the church family. It's great to have you with us this morning. I don't know what your week's been like and what you faced, but we come before God who comforts us in our sorrows, who's with us in our grief and pain, who rejoices with us in our victories, and who restores us and strengthens us in our weakness and tiredness. Whatever our week's been like, God knows, and he's been with us and he cares about it. A verse as we begin. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but rejoice over you with singing. So as we begin, let's pray to this God who delights in us, the mighty warrior who saves. Gracious and loving Father, thank you that you know our situations and you care for us. Thank you for the opportunity to, to gather virtually now. Help us focus as we hear the Bible read and taught as we pray together and as we sing praises to you. By your Spirit, change us to be more like Jesus, for your glory. Amen. So we sing our first song, which reminds us of how great and powerful our God is, who has held the oceans in his hand. Behold our God.
Hmm, what is this creed we've been learning about? Hmm, I wonder when it was written. Hmm, I wonder how it was discovered. I bet it was Indiana Jones who found it. I've done it! I've got the creed! Well, that was close. Let's see what this creed says. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Pete, wake up. We're on air. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Pete, wake up. We're on air. Hello and welcome to the Barnsley Better Than the News Bulletin. As you know, we've been learning about the Apostles' Creed, found by none other than Indiana Jones himself. Uh, no, it was written by early Christians to help people know clearly what they believed in. Have you been daydreaming again? Quite possibly. Of course, you're right. Christians around the world say these words to remind each other of the important things that we believe. Today, we're thinking about the line in the Creed that says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, I can tell you, we have an exclusive, a very special guest, the Holy Spirit. Um, where is he? Oh, he's already here. <laughs> I don't see him. Oh, in, he's in our hearts. Fantastic, breaking news. The Holy Spirit is here, and he lives in our hearts. What's he doing in there? Well, it says that the Father will give you another friend to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The Word cannot see him, but you know him, for he lives with you and be, will be in you. Fantastic! That is great news. The Holy Spirit is here and he lives in our hearts and he is here to help us know Jesus better. Well, let's go to our roving reporter who is speaking to people who believe in the Holy Spirit. Over to you, Janine. Yes, thank you, Pete. I'm here in Carlisle with Kath and Tommy from St Peter's Church. Thank you for allowing me to come into your house in this socially distanced way. Tell me, what does it mean to you to have the Holy Spirit living in your hearts? It's wonderful to have the Holy Spirit in my life. He guides and he helps me to see Jesus more clearly. And he helps me as I pray and read God's word, the Bible. The Holy Spirit is a comfort to me and helps me when I'm afraid and need God's help. He helps me to pray and I know that God is with me. Thank you, Kath and Tommy. This is great to hear. The Holy Spirit is God on earth living in our hearts. It's amazing when you think about it. Back to you in the studio. Thank you, Janine. Why not pray today and ask the Holy Spirit to guide your heart and mind? And we will be praying too. Well, that concludes the news. This is us saying good morning. <clears throat> oh, good night. Good night. Let me add my welcome to the service. My name is Andrew Towner and I'm the Vicar of Houghton and Kingmore. And the key item of church family news throughout August is to remind us that our church office will be shut 
and our emails will be down for the sake of holiday and annual leave and, and a breather. So the single uh, best way to make any contact with us if your need is urgent is to leave a message on the church office answer phone 01228 515 972. That answer phone will be checked once or twice during the week, uh, once in the middle of the week and once at the weekend. And uh, the volunteer who does that will be able to put you in touch with someone if your need is urgent. Otherwise, the office will reopen at the very end of August and we will look forward to getting back to you on other things as soon as we can. We admit our faults and failures to God, who knows all things and sees all things. But he is also a loving God, who is the mighty warrior who saves. And through the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we can be forgiven. So we come before God, approaching with confidence, knowing that our Father hears us, and is willing to forgive us. Let's pray the prayer that will appear on the screen. O Lord our God, you know us better than we know ourselves. As we come before you now, we all share a deep need, for we are all lost without your grace. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our troubled thoughts. Give us true repentance Forgive us all our wrongs. Transform us by your spirit to live for you each day, to love and serve each other, and through the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, to come at last to heaven. Amen. Almighty God, you forgive everyone who truly repents. Have mercy upon us. Forgive us by the death of your Son, Jesus. Strengthen us by the power of the Holy Spirit to live for you in all we do. Amen. And so we sing the glorious hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, the Lamb upon the Throne.
We come now to our time of intercession and I'd like to start by reading a verse from the uh, first chapter of Ephesians. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So with that in mind I'd like now to start as we pray together. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way of salvation that you have made possible so that those who put their faith and trust in the work that Jesus completed at the cross can become your children and enjoy the security of living with their sins forgiven. Father, we thank you for the hope that you, we have in Christ and for the future that we have with him. So as your children, we come to you and ask for your help and guidance in these difficult times. We know that the things that are happening to us are not a surprise to you, and we draw comfort from that. We ask that you will help and guide us as we respond to the different situations that arise. Help us to behave in ways that are a good example to others and to help and to share where we can. Father, we bring to you those whom we know who have lost someone close to them in recent weeks. We ask that you will be near to them at this difficult time, that you will comfort and console them that you will help them to adjust to their new situation and that you will help the church family to give them the help and support at this time. Father, we pray for those in our government and leadership. Help them to seek your wisdom as they make far-reaching decisions and we pray that you will guide them into outcomes that are just and fair for all who live under their influence. Father, we remember that for all who have put their trust in you, our hope is in the future that you have prepared for us in your presence with your people. Help us as we wait for that time to be faithful in our worship of you, to be faithful in our witness to your love for all and we pray that you will guide us each in a path of righteousness as we live and work for you here. We ask all this in the all-powerful name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus the Christ. Amen. The books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, they're two separate books in our modern Bibles, but that division is due simply to scroll length. It was originally written as one coherent story. We're just going to cover the book of 1st Samuel in this video. So after Israel was rescued from slavery in Egypt, they made a covenant with God at Mount Sinai and eventually came into the Promised Land. And there Israel was supposed to be faithful to God and obey the covenant commands. Before the book of Samuel, judges showed how Israel failed at that task big time. It was a period of moral chaos and it showed Israel's need for wise, faithful leaders. The book of Samuel provides an answer to that need. 
The book of Samuel's story focuses on three main characters. The prophet Samuel, where the book gets its name, and then King Saul, and after that, King David. And all three of them transitioned Israel from a group of tribes ruled by judges into a unified kingdom ruled by King David in Jerusalem. And the book of Samuel has a fascinating design that weaves the story of these three characters together in four main parts. Samuel, he's the key leader and prophet in the first section of the book, but then he also plays a key role in the next section, which is Saul's story. And it's told in two movements, Saul's rise to power and then his failures. And the second part is about his downfall and his tragic death. And then the drama of Saul's demise is matched by David's exciting rise to power. And then David's story is told in two movements. First, he rides the wave of his success, followed by his own tragic failure and the slow self-destruction of his family and then his kingdom. The book concludes with an epilogue that reflects back over the whole story. So let's dive in and see how this all unfolds. Part one picks up from the chaos of the book of Judges, and we're introduced to a touching story about a woman named Hannah. And she's grieved because she has never been able to have children. And by God's grace, she finally has a son named Samuel. And in joy, she sings this amazing poem in chapter two. And the poem is all about how God opposes the proud and exalts the humble, about how despite tragedies and human evil, God is working out his purposes in history. And also it's about how God will one day raise up an anointed king for his people. Now, Hannah's poem has been placed here at the beginning of the book to introduce these key themes that we're going to see throughout the whole story, like the next one. Samuel grows up and becomes a great prophet and leader for the people of Israel at the same time that the Philistines rise to power as Israel's arch nemesis. And in this crucial battle, the Israelites get arrogant and instead of praying and asking God for help, they trot out the Ark of the Covenant as this kind of magic trophy that will automatically grant them victory in battle. And so because of their arrogant presumption, God allows Israel to lose the battle and the Ark is stolen. So the Philistines, they take the ark and they place it in the temple of their god, Dagon. And then the god of Israel defeats the Philistines and the god Dagon without an army by sending plagues on the people. And then the Philistines don't want the ark anymore, obviously, and they send it back to Israel. And the point of this little story seems to be this. God is not Israel's trophy. And he opposes pride among the Philistines, but also among his own people. And so Israel needs to remain humble and obedient if they want to experience God's covenant blessing, which opens up into the next large section. The Israelites come to Samuel and they say, hey, we want a king like all the other nations have. Go find one for us. And so Samuel, he's kind of ticked off and he goes to consult with God. And God says, yes, their motives are all wrong, but if a king is what they want, give them one. And so we're introduced to the figure of Saul. Now, Saul is a tragic figure because he begins full of promise. He's tall, he's good looking, he's a perfect candidate for a king, but he has deep character flaws. He's dishonest, he lacks integrity, and he seems incapable of acknowledging his own mistakes. And so these flaws become his downfall. He wins some battles at the beginning, but his flaws run so deep, he eventually disqualifies himself by blatantly disobeying God's commands. And so the aging Samuel confronts Saul and Israel. He had warned the people that they would only benefit from a king who's humble and faithful to God. Otherwise, the kings of Israel will bring ruin. So he informs Saul that God is going to raise up a new king to replace him. And so Saul's downfall begins. As God, at the same time, is working behind the scenes to raise up that new king. It's an insignificant shepherd boy named David. He's the least likely candidate to be king. But the famous story of David and Goliath shows that God's choice of David is not based on his family status, but simply on his radical and humble trust in the God of Israel. And so this story embodies all of the themes of Hannah's poem. Proud Saul and Goliath are brought low, while humble David is exalted. From here, we watch Saul slowly descend into madness, while David rises to power. 
So David starts working for Saul as a general, and he's winning all of the battles, and he's also winning all of the fame. And so Saul gets jealous, and he starts chasing David around, hunting him, trying to kill him. David's done nothing wrong. And so David simply runs and waits in the wilderness. And here we see David's true character. He has multiple opportunities to kill Saul, but he doesn't. He simply trusts that despite Saul's evil, God will raise up a king for his people. What's interesting, too, is that many of the poems of David that you find in the book of Psalms are linked to this very period of his life, and they all express the same attitude of trust. And so this section of the book ends with Saul coming to a grisly death after losing a battle with the Philistines. First Samuel tells some of the most intricate, well-told stories you find anywhere in the Bible. And the characters Saul and David, they're portrayed very realistically. And the author's putting them forward as character studies so that you can find yourself in them. So in Saul's story, we see a warning. It's crucial that we reflect on our own character flaws and how they harm us and other people. And with God's help, we need to humble ourselves and deal with our dark side so that Saul's story doesn't become ours. David, on the other hand, is presented as an example of patience and trust in God's timing in our lives. And so he's running in the wilderness, being chased by Saul. David had every reason to think that God had abandoned him, but that's not what he thinks. And so David's story encourages us to trust that despite human evil, God is working out his purposes to oppose the proud and to exalt the humble. And that's what 1 Samuel is all about. Reading is taken from 1 Samuel 60, verse 1 and verse 6 to 14. Chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to J Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel saw Elab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesus called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Raham. And now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Hello, church family. Now It's now time for our sermon. Um, but before we begin, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please um, help me now as I preach. Help me to preach faithfully uh, and to preach clearly. And... Um, May our hearts all be warmed uh, into more love and more adoration of you and your son, Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Great. So we're picking up now um, from our full life series in 1 Samuel. Um, but for those of us who, who weren't in that, that, that series in full life, um, the context so far where we've got to is basically for the last three chapters before uh, chapter 16, 1 Samuel 16, where we are today, the first king of Israel, King Saul, has spent those chapters continually disobeying God, not doing what God has said, not listening to God. And so he has been rejected. And we see that in verse one in just a moment. But uh, in, a, in a world where 
Um, we are getting more fluent with videos and video making and so on. What we're gonna kind of do, to, we're gonna do today is we're gonna zoom in. We're gonna have like a wide angle zoom, medium angle zoom, and then a really kind of close up zoomed in version. Um, so to use that video, video analogy, we're gonna be zooming in today. And the wide angle is it's gonna be Jesse's sun, then slightly closer, we're gonna see that this is an obscure sun, and then that he's a sheep farmer, right, zooming in. So Jesse's son, the obscure sheep farmer. Uh, let's take the first one then, Jesse's son. So verse one uh, of our chapter, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Okay, looking back at what's just happened in the chapters. The Lord says, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Okay, so so now verse one, we're looking for a new king and from Jesse's son. So we had the, kind of all of Israel and now it's kind of been zoomed in and we're now looking at this one family, Jesse and his sons. Now, J Jesse rightly sees that if he anoints a king while the king is still living, that would be treason. So what happens uh, in the verses just after that is a sacrifice is arranged so that Samuel can then kind of get uh, legitimately close to Jesse without Saul seeing that it would be treason. Anyway, we fast forward to verse six uh, and they're all there. They're at the sacrifice. And now we see what kind of sons. So now we, that was our big zoom camera angle. Now we're zooming into the medium kind of one. And that is that we see that this son is uh, obscure. He's he's unassuming. He's he, what well, he's not the first choice. Because which son do we have there in verse six? If you look, um, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, Eliab, the firstborn son of Jesse, and he and he said, "Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord." So there he is, Eliab, and Samuel. Interestingly, like the rest of the people of Israel, hasn't changed. He's still impressed by externals. Do you remember when Saul was first made king? Saul was uh, really tall. He was impressive. He was handsome. He was good looking. And, and, and the people there were impressed by externals. But here, even Samuel needs correcting. And haven't we learnt since Saul's coronation, looking good isn't necessarily a good thing? Well, no, it, it shows us that the human tendency to love what is good. Anyway, verse 7 continues, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And we see an interesting thing here. You see, Eliab would just be another Saul. He would just be another Saul. He's, he's the people's choice. He's flashy, but not good for them. He wouldn't be good for them. We, we see that maybe two little suggestions in this verse. The, the first is um, this word height. And the Lord says, don't look at his appearance or his height. And that same word height is used for Saul in chapter 9 verse 2 where Saul is described as taller than anyone else. And it's also the same word sometimes that can, can be used in the context of pride. And so we think back to Hannah's song right in chapter 2 that set the whole seed and the whole theme for the book of the Lord almost opposing the proud and giving grace to the humble. And, and Hannah's song, she says, don't continue talking so proudly or, or, or loftily or arrogantly, this idea of loftiness, this height, this proudness. And so we see that actually there's, that's, we don't want to look at someone's height because we know straight from chapter two at the beginning of the book that the people on top crumble to the bottom. It's the, it's the little guy at the bottom whom God raises to the top. So straight away we see, oh, Eliab is described using the same words described for Saul. That's potentially dodgy. And we also see, you might have noticed it, that the Lord has rejected them both. He says in verse 7, for I have rejected him, that's Eliab. And in verse 1, since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Now this isn't a rejection of salvation, that sort of Eliab it cannot be saved. I think we see that it's a rejection to the office, the office of kingship. So he's been rejected as a, a candidate for king. You see that in verse 1 where it's, the Lord has rejected Saul as king over Israel. But the big thing here then is that um, 
God is saying, don't look at the externals. Saul was impressive. Eliab is impressive. But don't look at the externals. Throughout this whole chapter, there's this repeated word of of, of appearance or looking or seeing things. So you see see it... um, in verse 7 a few times where it says you know people look at the outward appearance the lord looks at the heart this appearance word is this is is, is linked to it um and so we see one of the big themes is, is what are you going to look at or what do what do you look for maybe and we're seeing that, that that god is saying don't look at the outward appearances because you see live sold they look the part think of it like this i'm going to say describe a person or say a job title and think what you picture in your head for that job title. So that what, what I'm going to say is presidential bodyguard. Right, okay, what, what, what do you think? When you think, what does a presidential bodyguard look like? If, 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 if your brain is kind of similar to me and we've watched the similar movies, you're thinking dark shades, the kind of the dark suit, there's the wire in his ear and then there's the kind of concealed gun ready to draw out at any moment. Okay, now they all look the part, they're buff. They don't really smile and they have broad shoulders. Now, now imagine if I then kind of came to, I don't know, wherever you would sign up to be the president's bodyguard. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be a bodyguard. Well, they, they go, look, who, who is this lanky fella? He's all gangly. What, what's going on? You don't look the part. You, 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 you wouldn't fit it because you, you're not looking at the part. And that's a similar way, you know, I, I don't look the part for a presidential bodyguard. And, and, and David's son, we, I mean, and Jesse's son, sorry, we haven't even met him yet. But we, he doesn't look the part. But the thing is, if I was a bodyguard, I, I probably wouldn't be a very good one. But the obscure son of Jesse that the Lord has chosen, well, he is the man for the job. He doesn't look the part, but he is he is the man for the job. And so, in verses 8 through to 10, we get this repetition of Jesse's sons not being chosen. The Lord has not chosen this one, nor has the Lord chosen this one. The Lord has not chosen these. So who 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 is the Lord going to choose? And then... Then we now we reach the kind of the very tight zoom that this is right zoomed in. Who is it? It's a sheep farmer. You you'll see Samuel asks, "Are these all the son you have?" And Jesse says, "There is still the youngest, but he is tending the sheep. He's a shepherd, but but the, I I called it sheep farmer because as Christians often we 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 taught to like shepherds." This future king of Israel here, he's a shepherd. Jesus is described as a shepherd. Um, our church leaders are called pastors, and pastor is a word that means shepherd. So as Christians, we kind of like, yeah, we love shepherds. And, and the point in this passage is that he's, he's a shepherd. He's with the sheep. And so I've, I've used the word sheep farmer just to try and help us remember this isn't something glamorous. You know, he's been out in the rain with all these sheep. You know, you, you, those of you who have dogs might know the wet dog smell, right? David has the wet sheep smell on him. You know, he's just being out for these wet sheep. He, you, know, you don't want to be near him. He's a bit stinky. He needs a shower. But he's a shepherd. And, and, and you'll see that even, even later on in this chapter, in verse 19, when Saul calls for this guy, he says, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Okay? He's with the sheep. That, that's his defining characteristic. He's a nobody. He's a sheep farmer. But this is the Lord's chosen one. This is the Lord's Messiah, his anointed. So they sent him and he arrives. And then, verse 12, um, he had him brought him in. Brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Now you might just for a moment be worried. This is it. We're told about Jesse's son's appearance. Is this warning bells? Are we, are we supposed to be worried? And I think, I think here it's not that externals are bad. But it's that externals don't matter. So Jesse's son can be good looking if he wants. But the whole point is don't look to that. It's the fact that that doesn't matter. It's what Lord looks at. Lord looks on the heart. He looks on the inside. And so, verse 13, the the verse we've all been waiting for. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Now, do you just notice something? This is the first time David's name is mentioned. 
He's just been Jesse's son. He's been the youngest guy. He's been the sheep farmer. He's so obscure that it takes till the 13th verse for his name to be mentioned. But he's God's chosen one. He's God's Messiah. And so the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord departs or has departed from Saul. Worse, an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. We'll talk about that in a few weeks' time. But here's the thing. God's chosen one, he's God's Messiah, so the Spirit equips David for the task of leading and ruling, and then by leaving Saul, like, unequips him for this task. So because God's looked at the heart, he's chosen David. Now, what are we to make of this? One one ancient commentator on this verse, a guy called Clement of Alexandria, said that, um, well, one of the things he said about this verse is that he said, looked at this passage and said, therefore, Christians shouldn't wear makeup. Is, is that what we're supposed to take away? God doesn't look at the externals, guys, so don't wear makeup. Now, that might be going too far, but what's the truth that he's getting at? Don't put all your stock in external appearances. It's not what it's not the outside that's important, it's what's on the inside. Or most crucially, just as David is the surprising choice. He's the obscure sheep farming son of Jesse. Just as David is the surprising choice, so David's greater son is also surprising. David's great, 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 and so on. Grandson is Jesus Christ. And what did people say about him? What did they say? They said, he is too much fun. You know, they compared him with one of his contemporaries, a guy called John the Baptist, and said, he's too boring. Jesus, he's too fun. Or they saw that Jesus grew up in a place called Nazareth, and they said, nah, he's from the wrong place. Almost crucially... They say anointed one, anointed ones, which is the same word as messiahs or Christ. You know, messiahs don't suffer. Messiahs don't suffer. And yet here he is on this cross suffering. If, if you are the son of God, save yourself, they cried. Because the, the, the appearance of Jesus on that cross was not what, what they, that, that's not the external appearances that they thought the messiah, God's chosen one, would have. You know, how do you save the day? I know, suffer. That, 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 that's not what we expect. We're saved, and, and yes, through Jesus' heroism, yeah, that's expected. But what we don't expect is that his heroism is his suffering. No one would have made that up. So maybe you're here today and you, th- you, 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 you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, and you think you know what Jesus is all about. Well, upon a closer inspection, Jesus always surprises. He always surprises. He's, he, he's never what you expect him to be. And his suffering and his dying on the cross is the most surprising thing. Taking our, our sentencing, our punishment on himself so that we might have a perfect relationship with God. No one would have expected that. God's way is surprising. The external is all wrong, but that's exactly God's plan. And then this then follows on to then the servants of God's chosen one. People like you, people like me. God's leaders, of the people in his church, they're not flashy. You know, you, you, look, you, look, you can look at various church leaders and and you sometimes think, you know, does God try and pick the least flashy people, the least kind of good-looking people or whatever? One example that comes to mind is um, John Piper, a, a, a pastor out in America, uh, at a conference, the Passion 2000, it was the year 2000 conference. He did a slightly famous now seashell sermon, that is uh, called, which later became his book, Don't Waste Your Life. Now, one person commenting years later on this sermon uh, said the following. He said, it's easy to see from the video of this sermon that John Piper doesn't exactly look like your average college conference speaker. Against the backdrop of a sea of designer jeans and and loose t-shirts and snapback hats, 
a 54-year-old man with curly grey hair, glasses and a tucked-in button-up shirt stands at the podium. But make no escape, m- no, sorry, make no mistake, he is at home among this crowd. For the thousands of those students, he is the one they've come to hear. You see, all these sort of trendy college students, they see beyond the externals of John Piper as this, yeah, like you said, guy with fuzzy grey hair, they see beyond it to the authentic gospel message, to the message about Christ and him crucified. And so so be aware maybe of your heart's desire to like the attractive preacher. If Christ is this obscure nobody following on from his uh, great-great-grandfather, King David, then we expect that also through Christ, then also Christ's servants, me and you, we're not going to be externally flashy, good-looking, attractive people in that sense. We've seen that our King, King Jesus, is the obscure nobody. He saves and he conquers, yes, but through suffering. And so Jesus' servants should expect to be pretty similar. Let me uh, pray to close. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage in the Bible that we've looked at today. Thank you that it helps us remember what's important and it's not the outward appearance. Thank you that actually your son, he saved and he saved through the the surprising way. He saved through suffering. He didn't look attractive or anything like that, but it was the but it, it was the fact that he was God and he had your the, 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 the heart of compassion that drew, drew people to him. Lord, please help us to not get distracted by the flashy things, the, 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 the glitzy, the glamorous. Help us, Lord, to, um, to treasure your son as this obscure nobody and so then to follow in that path of obscurity as well. Amen. Now, for next week, there are two things you can do. The first is that you can read 1 Samuel 17, which is the chapter we'll be looking at next week, so that that is familiar for you then. And the second is if uh, you want to do a craft to help you uh, remember what we've been learning about this week, uh, then get a you can get a notepad of paper, like so, or just two pieces of paper. And on one side, draw, on, on one piece, sorry, draw uh, a picture of a person. And then over the page, draw a heart. And as you can see, cut a window open. You might need your parents' help for this. So that, remind yourself that we see the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And then you can colour it in and do all sorts of things, make it look really pretty. Like that. Great. Well, that's all for me. Thank you.